Grab a Bible or your electronic device. If you don't have a Bible, there's some located under the seats in front of you. And turn to, you can turn to Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. I'm actually going to look at a different verse because I'm going to spend just a, a few minutes setting up three foundational truths that we have to understand in order for today's teaching to make more sense in our lives. And so what I want to do is I just want to briefly go through a couple of truths, three truths actually, and, and allow us to understand the depth of these truths because once we understand this, it changes our perspective and it causes us not only to read the scriptures differently, but causes us to even view our lives differently. So here's the first truth that I want to begin, and that is you were created with purpose. I'm going to begin in Psalm 139, and this is a passage that is many people's favorite scripture. It begins this way, for you formed my inward parts. How many of you, this is your favorite scripture? <laughs> one person, <laughs> two people, all right. First service, we had one, we had two, we doubled first service people, that's awesome. And uh, I, I assured them that we'd have more of this service, but oh well, we had 100% more, so I was right. But this verse is one that is very familiar to us, and it has just such powerful meaning. And here's what, this is King David writing this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking to God. But he says, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And I love this beautiful picture that God was intimately involved in our creation, that we were designed with purpose. And this is critical to understand because it's easy for us to think that we are simply an accident. It's easy for us to even devalue our own personalities, not realizing that when God was creating us, he was creating us perfectly for what he had in store for us. Now, I want you to think about it. Because in this room, there are so many different types of personalities. We have the rule followers. How many of you are rule followers? How many of you not so much? Actually, not so much people wouldn't even raise their hand because I asked you to. So. But how many of you are super organized? Yeah? How many of you not so much? How many of you like routine? How many of you not so much? Okay? Do you see the difference in the room? There's so many different personalities. And at times, we can be frustrated. We can be frustrated with our personalities. We can be frustrated with our looks, with the talents that we have or don't have. And, and, and so we, we think in our minds that somehow we don't have as much purpose or as much value as someone else. But what David was saying here, this powerful truth inspired by God, was he was saying, no, God perfectly designed us for a plan that he had for our lives. And then David goes on and adds even another layer of purpose in verse 16. He says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And then he says this powerful phrase, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This is what I often refer to as the double purpose of our creation. He says that when God was creating us and designing us, giving us our personalities, giving us our bodies, giving us our sense of humor, all the things that make us unique, when he was doing that, he fully knew all of the days of our lives. He knew where we would go, who we would connect with, and the choices that we would make. So as God was designing us, he was designing us for this perfect life that he had planned for us. Uh, not that our lives are perfect, but you understand what I'm saying. He understood all of the steps. But then it says also, the days were formed for me. So we are created for the days, but God also knew these days would be a part of his shaping of who we are and also the calling of our lives. So God said, I've designed you to perfectly live in the days that I've designed for you. So where this we have to begin is understanding we were created with purpose. It's so easy for us to lose sight of this because we can think that if we don't do as much as the person next to us, then we don't have a great purpose. If we don't have a ton of money in the bank, then we don't have great purpose. If we don't have a, a job title that was one that everyone respects, then we might not have purpose. If we don't look like someone else, we don't have the same purpose. But God says, no, every single person that was created, every single person, God was intimately involved in that, creating you for the days that he had planned for you. So this is the first truth, and we'll come back to this in a moment. Here's the second truth, then, is that discipleship is a life surrendered. You see, Jesus told us that if we decided to follow him, 
then what we would have to do is take up our cross daily, deny ourselves, die to ourselves, and follow him. And the reason this is important is just because you have a purpose doesn't mean you need to walk in that purpose or that you choose to walk in that purpose. God gives us free will. And unfortunately, most of humanity, even though they're designed with a purpose, most of humanity walks in the opposite direction. But if you decide to follow Jesus, what you have to do is surrender your own purpose, to surrender your wants and your desires to follow him. And Jesus, when he took his disciples, and these were men that were following after him, he says, if you want to continue this process, then here's what you have to do. You have to die to your own wants. As you make plans for your life, you have to surrender those to my plans for your life. As you think about goals that you want to set and things you want to accomplish and things you want to have in your life, you have to be willing to surrender those in order to submit to what I have for your life. And so the second truth is that discipleship is a life surrendered. And then here's the third, is that Jesus then commissioned all of us. So each one of us have been commissioned, sent out. And I love this phraseology, commission. Because it has an aggressive tone to it. It's actually one often used in the military. But Jesus said to us a command, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and his promises, and I will be with you always. But in this we see, this is how we were designed to live. We were created for a purpose, but we had to choose to surrender our lives to that purpose. And when we surrendered our lives, Jesus then said to us, The purpose of your existence now is to advance the kingdom of God. So how we are supposed to live from this point forward is not for our own personal advancement, but for the advancement of what Jesus wanted us to do. So Jesus mentored and modeled life to his disciples. And then as he was leaving, he says, now here's your responsibility. You have learned to mimic me over the last three years. I want you to go and find men and women now and train them to do the same thing. So they're going to mimic your life as you mimic me. And this process is going to go on until I come back. And what I want you to do is to change the whole world. So your viewpoint has to now be outward instead of inward. Let me give you a visual, because I'm a visual person, so it works well for me this way. But I want you to imagine this is you. And so when God was creating you and designing you, He knew the different seasons of your life, and he knew that he would place you in different environments. And when I mean environments, I just simply mean the places where you exist and you operate. So he knew what family you'd be born into. That's an environment. He knew what jobs you would take. That's an environment. He knew where you would live, and he knew where you would go to church, and he knew the friends that you would run with. And and each one of these is an environment. So when God was designing you, he knew all of these were coming. He knew at what season of life you would be with this group of friends, and then you would change and be with this group of friends, and then you would take this job, and then you would take that job. But in each of our lives, we have different environments where God has placed us. But he also knew within those environments, there would be steps that we would take. And that's my phraseology, but what I mean is choices we would make, actions, decisions that we would take. And that each one of us, every single day, would have many opportunities to choose one way or another. We could choose to follow the way that God has for us, or we could choose to follow our own path. And and the mercy of God, the benefit of that is even when we choose poorly and we go down a destructive path, if we choose to follow him, he leads us out of that destruction. But all of us would have environments. All of us would have steps that we have to take. But this is what we have to understand. The value and importance of the environments and the decisions that we make all are shaped around the truth that he also placed in our lives relationships. Each one of us have individuals that God has placed around for us, and they are his purpose. The advancement of the kingdom of God is not an advancement of real estate. It's not an advancement of finances. It's not an advancement uh, of just increasing power. When God talks about the advancement of the kingdom of God, he's talking about more men and women coming to know who Jesus is, surrendering their life to him, and experiencing the fullness of life. So in our lives, God places people in our lives, in our circle of influence, for us to connect to them. But what has to change in our minds is the natural rhythm of our culture, how we've been taught and trained, is that we think every single relationship is focused on us. We think that the purpose of every relationship in our lives is to make our lives better. This is just how we're naturally taught as we grow older. And the way I can prove that is the rhythm of our culture is if a relationship quits benefiting you, our culture would simply tell you to end that relationship. So you have a friend that no longer acts friendly toward you, what should you do? Cut it off. If you have a job that you don't like, what should you do? You should end that job. You have a boss you don't like, find another job. 
unfortunately, even in our culture, and I'm, I'm not saying this to be unsympathetic because I realize there's so many dynamics, but also in our culture, your marriage isn't working out, your husband, your wife isn't meeting your needs anymore, divorce, try it again somewhere else. E even if we see this in the church world, a church no longer meets your needs, find another church. And, and here's what I want to say. There's valid reasons for all of these things. I'm not, I'm not knocking all of these things. I'm saying there's valid reasons. But what we have to acknowledge is we get into a rhythm that simply says, if something in a relationship is no longer beneficial, then my immediate response should be to cut it off. But Jesus says, actually, when you surrender yourself to the purpose and calling of your life, every relationship then becomes about the people around you. So no longer is the value and purpose of a relationship and what someone can do for you, the value and purpose of that relationship is what you can do in those relationships. So if you're in a job where you're not loving your boss and you're not loving your coworkers, anybody in that situation? <laughs> be careful, they might be in this room. <laughs> you're in that situation, it's difficult. And so in your mind, you're thinking, I gotta find something else. I gotta find something else to do. But when you realize, wait a second, this is my calling. God has placed me here. On the day that he was knitting me together in my mother's womb, he knew that this many years later that I would be standing in this environment and all of these people would be the potential. This would be my calling to advance his kingdom by showing them love. So if you're in a relationship and that person isn't giving as much as they're taking and you're frustrated and you just are tempted to end it, you must first go to Jesus and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do in this relationship? And most often, he'll simply tell you to show love to that person. So you're in a dating relationship, and it, it has some tension. Ask God to direct you. You're in a marriage, and, and this is the rhythm. In our marriages, we think it's all about them serving us. But over and over in scriptures, it's, he tells us it's actually about us serving them. So they're no longer meeting your needs. It doesn't change your calling. You should be meeting their needs, living for them living to encourage them and to support them, to make them stronger as a person. And when we understand this, every relationship in our lives start to look differently because we're viewing them now through the purpose of advancing the kingdom of God. I realize this person is red, and we'll come back to them later. So for all of you uh, detail people, you're probably driving you crazy, right? But here's what I want to do then. And so when we look at this, we go, okay, so this is my calling. My calling is to advance the kingdom of God. But what does that look like? Well, again, here's what Jesus said. He said, go and do the things I taught you to do. So here's what Jesus is saying. Advance the kingdom of God by mimicking him. We advance the kingdom his way. And so what I want to do today as we go through our study on Luke is I want to look at actually multiple passages of scripture beginning in Luke 13, 10. And I want to look at specifically what Jesus did so that we can be challenged in our own behavior. And so in, in chapter 13, verse 10, we see the first thing. The kingdom of God, and I'll just tell you the point, and then I'll explain it. The kingdom of God should be spiritual. In verse 10, it says, Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a synagogue would be comparable to a modern-day church. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. Stop there. Here's what we have to understand about this story, is that what it seemed like from the outside is that this woman simply had a physical condition. For 18 years, she had a disability. But what Jesus points out, is it was actually a spiritual issue. Now, Jesus defines them differently in Scripture. There are times he comes across people, and they're just simply physically sick, and he heals them. But he is pointing out that this woman's condition was actually a spiritual condition. A demonic force was controlling her life. And we've seen throughout our study in Luke that at times men and women were demon-possessed, and they did destructive things in their lives, and they had the, the, the demon, demonic powers had authority over them and were controlling them. This is the same situation. So Jesus steps onto the scene, and everyone that's looking at it simply sees it as a physical situation, but Jesus sees it as a spiritual situation. So he lays his hands on her and casts out the demons, sets her free, and she's physically restored. So he actually addresses the spiritual and the physical changes. But then the crowd responds, and it's specifically this religious leader. And now Jesus is going to acknowledge another spiritual condition that's impacting the physical. It says, but the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, 
said to the people, get this guy's response. He says, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed. (laughs) If there's ever a passage that makes you want to throat punch someone, it's this one right here. You might not be throat punchers. You might be forehead smackers. But this person's arrogance. He says, we're supposed to take a day off the Sabbath and not work. And he goes, those are the, all the other days are the days you're supposed to come to be healed. He's so concerned about following a man-made law. He is gripped by the spirit of legalism. And so Jesus speaks to him and says, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eight years be loosed from the bond of the Sabbath day on the Sabbath day as he said these things all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at, the, at all the glorious things that were done by him so here's what happens Jesus steps into this situation and everyone sees it as a physical reality the woman is is in a disabling condition and Jesus says no this is spiritual and so Jesus lays hands on her and he sets her free And then this other person, where people look at and think this is a physical thing, Jesus goes, no, this is a spiritual thing. This is an issue of his heart. And so Jesus speaks spiritually and changes this woman's life, and he speaks and changes the community that's there listening. And this is the same challenge that each one of us have. Are we bringing the spiritual into our physical situations? See, it's so easy for us to walk simply looking at the physical because we're physical beings. This is who we are. But we have to acknowledge and recognize that what's really challenging us is a spiritual force. Paul says it this way. He goes, we don't wrestle simply in the flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers. And I know if you're not familiar with spiritual things, that sounds kind of hokey pokey, kind of weird. Hokey pokey, that's the right way to word it. It sounds strange. But what we have to acknowledge is that God says he is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What we have as Christians, understand this, what we have is spiritual. It's the only power we have that's different than the world. But the truth is the world is controlled in a spiritual way. So when we step into darkness, we must represent the light in those situations. So how does that practically look? Instead of just talking about what do we practically do? Well, here's the the simple challenge. How often are we praying for physical situations? How often does something happen, and our first response to it is, I'm going to pray about this. So I have a tension with someone. How often do we just run to prayer and say, God, I need you to move in this situation? Uh, Last night, my wife and I were talking about uh, a situation with one of our sons, and someone at school just keeps saying really rude things to him. And and I've told you before, that's kind of a struggle for me. Like, you know, if if I've ever attempted to choke a little kid out, it's in that situation. And so last night, I mean, Mary tells me this, and my immediate response is, I mean, I went dad mode immediately. I'm like, you know, (laughs) you can imagine. Use your imagination there, okay? And I'm so frustrated. And then we turn off the lights, and my adrenaline is still going. I'm laying in bed. Mary falls asleep. I'm sweating because my adrenaline is going. And I'm thinking about the situation. And then I thought, I need to pray about this because, one, I'm not going in the right direction (laughs) with it. But, two, I need God to move. I need God to fix the situation. I want him to secure my son's heart, but I want him to give me wisdom on what to say, what not to say. I I want him to give my son wisdom on how to respond. And I was realizing right now, this is a spiritual attack. It's a spiritual attack against my son. It's a spiritual attack against me as his father. And I want God to be honored. And so I invited God into the situation and I'm asking him to move. And this is the, the rhythm that we have to have. Are we praying for our marriages? Are we praying for our work environments? Are we praying for our finances? Are we praying for our healing? Are we inviting the spiritual into our physical situations? I think about in the story in Acts, uh, Peter and, and John are walking up these steps, and there's a crippled man right there, and he asked them for money. Because in this man's perspective, he needed money to buy food to survive. He was simply thinking about the physical. He didn't even consider that there might be something better that they could give them. He just knew, I need this physical thing. I need money. So they're walking up the steps, and he goes, you know, beggar, beggar, can you give me some money? And I just, how I picture it is that Peter and John were like, oh, man, we don't got any money. Like, they pulled their pockets out, and they're like, we don't have any money. And Peter goes, silver and gold have I not, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus and Nazareth, get up and walk. And this man is healed instantly. He stands up and he walks away. And and the people are amazed. What they brought into that situation was spiritual. They gave him healing. 
through the power of God in their lives. In our situation, are we bringing the spiritual into the physical situations of our lives? If someone comes to you and they talk about some struggle in their lives, how quickly do you go to a spiritual conversation? It should be your immediate response. This is an open door that God has given you. Someone comes to you and says, my marriage is struggling. Can I pray for you? If someone comes to you and they say, my finances are struggling, can I pray for you? They come to you and they say, oh, the boss, this and that. Hey, can I pray for your heart? Can I pray for wisdom for you? Because, again, what we have to offer is not simply physical. The greatest gift that we have to offer is that the spirit of the living God is inside of us. And we have the ability to introduce people to a new path, a spiritual path, that will lead them toward God who can solve their problems. And so are you willing to have spiritual conversations? Are you willing to invite them to church? You know, we have so many insecurities about witnessing to people and inviting them to church. But when someone comes to you and they bring up their issue, that is an open door to invite them. Come to church. Because what you're saying to them is, here's the reason for the reason I have hope. I go to church and I connect with God and, and this changes my life. And when we do that, God will use that to bring the spiritual into a physical situation and change the reality. Here's the second truth. Go over to chapter 14. 14 verse 1. The second truth is that the kingdom of God should be supernatural. So in this story, it sounds very similar to the one we just read. It says, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Dropsy is a condition where the body retains fluid. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So Jesus is remembering what just took place recently, and he asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So here's what Jesus does. He steps onto the scene, and he once again does a supernatural physical healing on this man. And the man is restored, and he leaves completely healthy. Here's the truth. God has given us the authority and the power to bring the supernatural into our situations. Now, we are intimidated by the supernatural. There's no doubt about it. Because God operates in the rhythm of his sovereignty. And at times, he does things specifically that we ask for. At times, he does them differently. But we cannot lose sight of the fact God still does the supernatural, even though he does it in a mysterious way. Even at times, his timing is different. What he says yes to, it, it doesn't make sense to us. What he says no to doesn't make sense to us. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that God has invited us as his people to bring the supernatural into the situations of our lives. And, and when we hear supernatural, we automatically always go to physical healing. It's kind of the rhythm of the church. Here's what I'll tell you. I believe in supernatural physical healing. We've proven that as a church, right? Today, we invited people to come forward. We're praying over them. I, I've experienced supernatural physical healing in my life. But I'll tell you, that is not the only supernatural way that God moves. God moves supernaturally every single day. And I can prove it to you this way. We, I'm going to ask some questions, and I want you to respond. How many of you, just respond by raising your hand. How many of you has God supernaturally changed your life? Will you raise your hand? Look, look around the room. Keep them up high. Even you non-rule followers, just follow along for a minute, okay? All right, put your hands in. How many of you has God supernaturally restored a relationship that was broken? Look at, look at the hands. All right, hands down. How many of you has God supernaturally given you wisdom or direction? You just knew it was from God. Look at that. How many of you God has supernaturally helped you financially? Yeah. How many of you God has saved someone that you were praying for and it shocked you that he saved them? Awesome. How many of you have experienced a supernatural physical healing from God? My hand's up on this. Do you see how God is still supernaturally moving every single day? And do you know the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed? I know it. it he, has, he did so many miracles. But the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed was salvation, right? Think about it. Lazarus. He was dead for multiple days. Jesus walks up to the tomb and goes, Lazarus, comes out, come out. And he comes walking out, waddling in his grave clothes. And Jesus raises him back to life. And everyone could look at that and go, the greatest miracle Jesus ever did from La for Lazarus was raise him from the dead. But you know, it wasn't because Lazarus physically died again. But Lazarus eternally lives in heaven with Jesus. That was the greatest miracle. 
And in our situation, we must consistently believe that God can do above and beyond anything that we can imagine. We must believe and pray and seek God and act like God can do a miracle. Because otherwise, we will be oppressed by the reality of our situation. When we're facing obstacles bigger than ourselves, we will carry a burden we're never designed to carry. When we see a situation where someone needs God to move, if we don't believe God still does miracles, then we will not invite God into that situation. And one of the most haunting verses in Scripture is where Jesus says, you have not because you ask not. You don't have it because you didn't ask for it. Last night, yesterday I went to this event, and, and they were selling some like hot dogs and stuff and some chips. And so I grabbed a bag of chips, and I ended up not eating them, a bag of Doritos. And so they were sitting on the counter. And so my youngest son, Lincoln, comes up to my room, and I'm finishing my notes on the bed. And he goes, hey, Dad, those chips downstairs, are those yours? And I go, yep. I just let it stay a little awkward in the air. I'm staring at him. He goes, you going to eat them? And I go, nope, not right now. He goes, okay. He's like, you, you like those chips? I go, yeah. And I know exactly what he wants. But I just want him to ask for them. So in that moment, I'm like, you know what, Lincoln? You have not because you asked not. No, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking... <laughs> Just ask for him. And, and, and Lincoln's as subtle as a hand grenade. You know, I, I know what he wants, and my kids will do that. My daughter, Nora, I'll be eating 100% of the time. She doesn't matter if she just ate. I'll sit down and I'll eat. She'll come down next to me or sit next to me. She'll put her arm around my arm, and she'll look at me, and she'll just stare at me. And I just keep eating, and I'll look at her, and finally she'll go, can I have a bite? And I'm like, yeah, I give her a bite. She has because she asked. This is the same thing. God is saying to us he wants to supernaturally move in our situations. But we have to believe. And we have to ask God to do above and beyond anything that we can imagine. Now, here's the last point I want to point out. Look at chapter 14, verse 12. And that is the kingdom of God should be practical. So Jesus is at this dinner. It says, he's also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. So Jesus has challenged his motives. He goes, here's the, the natural rhythm is you're going to invite rich people. You're going to invite si uh, your brother, sisters, people you know, because then when they have a party, they're going to invite you, and it's gonna, the blessing is going to continue. Jesus goes, I want you to have a completely different perspective. And here's what he says. But when you give a feast, he says, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Here's what Jesus is just simply saying. He's saying, be practical. If you're going to advance the kingdom of God, look around and see who has the most obvious needs. He says, if you're going to throw a feast, who needs to come to the feast the most? Hungry people. Who, who needs to have a party? People who are down, the crippled, the lame, the rejected. Jesus' response is just simply be practical. Look around and see the needs around you. See, at times we can look at situations, and I've actually had this in a, a comical way, where people will come and they'll say, yeah, I saw this person in need, and can you just pray that God will meet their need? And I think in my mind, you can meet their need. If you look at a person and they don't have clothes and you have clothes, do I need to go, God, <laughs> do you want me to give them clothes? No, I have clothes, give them to them. And this is what Jesus is saying, take a practical posture. See, when I look at this, I've seen the two extremes on this. I've seen people that are so bent on the supernatural that they lose sight of the practical. The people that all they want to do is pray, 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 and not actually do anything physical. And, and, and what we see in Scripture, it's both and. It's not either or. But I've also seen the other extreme where people are so practical they never look for the supernatural. God is saying to us, we are spiritual beings. We need to embrace both the supernatural and the physical. So here's a question in your life right now. What are the obvious needs around you, and how can you meet them? And what needs to change for you to see the obvious needs? When, when Steve Oldrin taught a few months ago now, maybe even more than that, he, he, I mean, I don't know if you guys remember that, he gave like 19 testimonies about things that happened to him at Kroger. Do you guys remember that? And I was like, man, he goes to Kroger differently than I do, because I go in there with a purpose with my head down, and I, I kind of charge in there, get my stuff, and I go out. So I've had to tell myself, slow down. And so I walk into Kroger now trying to make eye contact with everybody. And, and, and awkwardly so, you know, and, and I'm looking around and, you know, how you doing? And it's, it's not working. No, I'm just kidding. But, but I'm just looking for opportunities. And even when I go to the cash register and I've had those moments where I, the person, I'm just talking with them. 
And I'll say, hey, I'll pray for you on that situation. I had one time a lady who obviously was physically sick, and I said, I'll just pray for you today. And she said, thanks. And there's been times I'm like, can I pray for you? And they're like, huh? And, you know, it's just so awkward. And you're like, I'll pray for you. <laughs> you know, and I walk out. But it's that, for me, it is honestly, is the rhythm of just slowing down and saying, God, show me the needs around me. Allow me to have open eyes to see what's going on around. Allow me to pause and have conversation. Allow me to ask questions of people. If I see their posture is down, don't breeze on by. Just, God, show me the opportunity where I can stop and look at them and go and talk to them. Hey, is there anything going on that you want to talk about? Anything I can do to meet that need? The kingdom of God should be practical. And here's the weight of all of this. Turn now to the very end of chapter 14. This phraseology might not be familiar to you, but Jesus told us as, as the Christians that we are the salt and the light to the world. So in verse 34, Jesus says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Here's what Jesus just said. He looked at these three things and he said, this is what the kingdom of God needs to be doing. But if it doesn't do these three things, it's worthless. It's pointless. If the kingdom of God is not introducing spiritual to the world, it's pointless. If the kingdom of God is not doing supernatural miracles, it's pointless. If the kingdom of God is not meeting practical needs, it's pointless. And so the challenge for us is we don't want to live pointless lives. We want to live lives of purpose. We want to experience and live out the calling of our lives. But we have to be willing to be spiritual. We have to be willing to invite the supernatural. And we have to be willing to be practical. And here's the reason why. I told you I'd come back to the red person. So let's go back. When God was creating us, it says that he designed all of our days for us and designed those days for us and us for them. So in our lives, we will have a group of people that we influence and we connect to. And so I picked one person. I said, well, let's think about this person. When God was creating them and creating their life, he knew every day of their life. And even if they didn't choose to walk in the truth of God's words, God still had their life planned out. And in their life, instead of having people around like we do that are similar to us, in their life, let's go to the next one, they have people that are similar to them, but then there's you in their life. And the truth is that God knew at some point in their life he was going to bring into their connection a person of light. And that person is you. But if you're not consistently walking around in your life in, in a spiritual reality, if you're not consistently being the light and shining it, if you're not asking God to do supernatural things, if you're not meeting practical needs, then the truth is you're not shining the light. And if you're not the light, they walk in darkness another day. And there is a lot of weight in that statement, that their days were planned out knowing God knew one day they would come in, into contact with you. But the question is, when people come into contact with you, what are they experiencing? Are they experiencing just another day of darkness or are they experiencing a life so different from everyone else that they can't help but notice and be drawn to it? And so this is the purpose of our lives, to advance the kingdom of God the way that Jesus lives. And that is spiritual, that is supernatural, and that is practical. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I'm so thankful that you challenge us. I'm thankful that you give us the opportunity to be a part of your kingdom. I'm thankful that you give us gifts and you give us relationships. I'm thankful you connect us with different individuals that we maybe wouldn't normally do on our own. But we're asking for you to help us embrace the calling of our lives. Help us to always seek to in include the spiritual into our lives. We know that means that we have to be daily filled with your spirit. It's impossible to pour out if we're empty, so help us to remember that to spend time daily in prayer, to spend time daily in your word and in worship and going to church and connecting because we want all of the people that connect to us to be blessed by the overflow of what you're doing in our lives. And Lord, help us to believe that you still do miracles. Help us to live accordingly so we can take dramatic steps of faith. Help us to also have sensitive eyes to see around us, to do the practical. Give us opportunity even today, we ask. And Lord, we pray all of this in your holy and powerful and precious name. Amen.